And welcome to another edition, the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 675. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's July 23rd, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted on Friday. Before we get too far, this is the point where I ask you to donate. Please donate your likes to us. If you see us on Facebook or YouTube, there's always a little like button. You just you click that. Some people say you smash that. If you're from Europe, you say you pop that. So just you mash it, whatever you can do hit that like button because it's free advertising for George and I, and we don't want to spend your money on advertising. If by chance, you don't want to sit around just watching two white guys on screen. You can listen to us in podcast format, audio only. Go to the show notes on YouTube to see where that happens. Um, if you're not subscribed to the show, please subscribe. You guys, lots of good comments last week. We read every one. Sometimes we respond to them. And if you're not shared Anglican Unscripted with somebody recently, it's time. Now is the time. This show has hit its, its peak, its ebb. Well, I mean... <laughs> In Anglican terms, we have hit the pinnacle of our success. Hopefully there's more, but we'll see. George, how's your week going? Very busy at church. Uh, today's a work day. Uh, outside, we had four contractors. The roofer, the stucco man, the uh, plumber, and the uh, guy who does the uh, alarm box, fire alarm box. And in between rain showers, I've been outside uh, using the weed whacker and the edger and just trying to make the church all spiffy. It's... it's uh, well, you're still recovering uh, from the lightning strike, right? Yes, we have a roof leak in the steeple, and that's caused some of the caused drips in the sanctuary and some of the stucco to come off the side of the steeple, and and the, the fire alarm box is out because of the lightning strike, and the water heater in the kitchen of the church is uh, parish hall is out. I don't think that's lightning. I think that's just. Uh, uh, seven years uh, since we built this building, and now I guess it's time for a new water heater. It's only seven years old. Yes, I didn't know that. All right, it, it looked a little older, but not you, not twenty. But okay, cool. All right, so last week we started a new tradition, and I'm calling it a tradition. The tradition is the first story is going to be a good story, and I don't care how hard we have to look. In these times, these end times, we will find a good story. Now, I wrote down here that uh, GAFCON is going non-geographical down under, uh, and that's kind of a good story. I, I'm not real big on non-geographical, but I can see the purpose here. What's the story, George? GAFCON Australia had a meeting last week, this past week, and they announced that they would set up a non-geographic diocese for Anglican parishes and the Anglican Church of Australia who found themselves on the wrong side of the gay marriage line. The appellate tribunal of the Anglican Church there is going to decide whether dioceses have a local option on gay marriage. That currently, right now, the gay marriage is not permitted, but it's being said that, well, we should have this right to interpret the marriage canons as we see fit. And there are some dioceses, some have already gone ahead with this some have their bishops have openly said they would support this and so we'll see what the decision says so if the decision goes against the traditionally minded people and let's say you're in western australia in perth and that's a liberal bishop archbishop and you have a conservative uh, evangelical diocese or anglo catholic uh, evangelical parish or anglo catholic parish and you wish to move uh, GAFCON, Australia will set up a non-geographic diocese to, ac diocese to accommodate you, to give you alternative Episcopal oversight. We'll also see what happens. Sort of what we have in New Zealand. Yeah, it, sort it, of like it, what we have in New Zealand. It's exactly what we have in New Zealand. We saw that also here um, with uh, foreign provinces in America about 15 years ago. Um, it seems to work. It, it certainly worked back then, and, and it, you know, I got a hope for the future with Australia. It's it's just it's so hard to see this news that happened here 15 years ago repeated in Australia and other countries. Um, yeah, that's it's still a good news story. Gafka non geographical down under is a good news story. George, um, you and I talked recently about the riots going on in South Africa, 
and you and I in the pre-show were talking and battery back and forth, and you said, you know, it may have been a coup attempt. I said, what makes you think it's a coup attempt? It was just a bunch of people rioting, burning down pharmacies and other things, and um, taking out local um, merchants. I don't think it was a coup, and you said you have more information. What's that information? Well, I don't have more information. You were given more information. But yeah. I've been told, I was given more information. Dave Dufton is one of the authors at Anglican Inc., and he's a South African. He lives in Port Elizabeth, which is in the Western Cape. And I was contacting Dave in the middle of these riots. How you guys doing? Everything okay? And he said, there's nothing around here. We're fine. The violence is mainly centered in Nat KwaZulu Natal province and around Johannesburg and the townships. And one of the things Dave says, you know, it's all now settled down. And Dave shared that there's speculation that there's some political element in this. And that when we had the George Floyd riots in Minnesota and in other cities in the United States, Kevin and I, you and I were sort of like Dave. In other words, we saw nothing. We heard nothing locally. Everything's fine. It happened far away in another part of the country. It happened far away. It was on TV. And it wasn't going for the infrastructure, although they would block highways. That was that was the the only infrastructure. The and in South Africa, in especially in the townships uh, in, around Soweto and around Johannesburg, and Pretoria, and in parts of uh, and in Natal province, there was massive looting of small businesses, and it developed into looting of factories and warehouses. Um, the LG warehouse, which has all the TVs and monitors, was completely emptied of hundreds of millions of rands worth of equipment. Um, the oil refineries had to shut down. But what the difference between the George Floyd riots, riots which was politicized criminality um, and creation of anarchy, was that the rioters in KwaZulu-Natal province were attacking cell phone towers. They were attacking port facilities. They were attacking infrastructure. Um, the speculation is that Jacob Zuma was the first Zulu uh, president and he's now going to go to jail and his supporters in the secret secret police which is very politicized it's mm -hmm. almost like it's it's our FBI unfortunately has become like their secret police in South Africa security service being well, a tool but, of but they're also thugs yes yeah okay. well that the regular police are thugs yeah, okay uh, um, the secret police may have been in back of this to cause a coup attempt to, th uh, to either break off Natal into its own country or uh, to so destabilize the current uh, government that uh, we have anarchy. Now, what Kevin is referring to is one of the things that's been documented in these riots is that the South African Police Service, many of their officers took part in the rioting. See, unlike Minneapolis, where the office or Portland, where the police were told to stand down, stand back, don't use your guns. If, if a liberal is crying, don't fire tear gas at him because he's crying already. Uh, be nice to these children. In South Africa, the police structure hierarchy just broke down completely and officers uh, took part in the mass looting. Hmm. And there's a terrible story of five policemen are accused of murdering a white farm manager, torturing him to death and stealing his cattle, cattle rustling. And that the, the murders of white farmers by uh, uh, political gangs is increasing. And now these political gangs have serving police officers as their gunmen and triggermen. The South yeah. African police service is, is allegedly corrupt top to bottom. I do want to correct what I said before about, you know, BLM and Antifa did not go for infrastructure. They did go for the police department, so they did go for the precincts and uh, some other government offices. They wanted to, in Portland, uh, take out the federal uh, offices as well. Uh, but they didn't want to go for the cell towers. That would have been the, the big thing to do, but then they, they couldn't communicate. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to see this in the 21st century, you know, how do you conduct a coup or a riot? Well, Reuben Phillip, the former Bishop of the Diocese of Natal, uh, is of Indian, uh, Asian Indian descent. And he was, he's been very prominent in the press after these riots because 220 people died or were murdered 
uh, and usually it was looters killing other looters. Uh, not that many people died at the hands of police or in uh, militias trying to protect property. But there's been a major push on social media to basically incite African blacks against Indians, against the Afrikaner farmers and, mm -hmm. and so on. In other words, to try to turn this into a race war. And Reuben Philip, the bishop of Natal, former bishop, uh, he's retired, uh, is saying, no, 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 we have come so far. Don't, let's f don't allow the evil people who want to put black against Indian, black against white, uh, don't allow them to have a voice. See, Indians sort of hold the, uh, you know, the sort of the joke is that uh, you go into an inner city in the United States, you go to the 7-Eleven or the dry cleaner or the little shop, it's run by Koreans. Uh, in South Africa, it's run by Indians. And so Indians have uh, been uh, accused of uh, all sorts of racist practices by uh, black extremists for demanding their customers pay them and not steal stuff and uh, things of that nature. So Reuben Philip and the Anglican churches and the other churches are trying very hard to settle the racial divides that are arising and also call for the government to investigate this and don't just pass it off as well it's been a boring summer therefore you know boys will be boys we'll just allow them to riot yeah boys will be boys uh back to uh our storyboard here uh our next story is out of india and yeah <laughs> you guys <laughs> it's it's not what you think but it's 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 sad nonetheless you know the reality is in this day and age when we get to watch tv and and videos about what goes on around the world everything now is recorded everything whether it's parliament in pakistan or a uh, some meeting happened in india or singapore around the world and you get to see how other people react uh under stress and i remember watching you know Indian parliamentary procedures when it was on 60 Minutes or, or CNN one night and they're throwing shoes at each other and they're just having an all-out brawl and I remember another one in Pakistan and uh, some other foreign countries and, you know, over the last you know 10-15 years seeing that violence break out at the secular uh, level in government. Not surprising. Our history as an American is we had violence at our, in our early stages as well more recent too and so there's a video going around about a diocese in india having the same type of violent eruption and george i saw blood <laughs> the Man. diocese diocese of queen Batore, the church of yeah. south india now this diocese has been notorious for being a hotbed of corruption mm -hmm. its former bishop manikan Dorai is actually in jail for theft stealing from the diocese and it's just a cesspit. Its current bishop is none too clean, my, my friends in India tell me. And there was a meeting of the diocesan council, and they were going to discuss corruption. And one of the uh, members of the council accused another group of members of corruption, of stealing from the diocese. And a fight broke out that was recorded on uh, uh, cell phones. Now, when a fight breaks out at the Diocese of Central Florida, it's over whether or not acolytes can wear brown shoes or they have to wear black shoes. Um, that's our fights. Here, the different parties got up, and you can see them taking, like, the microphone stand and beating uh, the heads with blood. Uh, chairs, hitting each other with chairs, well, free-for-all of utter complete chaos and violence at the Diocese of South India, Coimbatore. Uh, God, these guys <laughs> just, I really should press, you should just press the reset button and start over. I'm, I'm serious. Well, I mean, I alluded to this happens also at the secular level and all levels of government there. Um, I'm not surprised it hit the church. I am surprised that it's making the round so much on social media. Uh, yeah, the, the church, church is supposed should not to, be a reflection of the world. Sadly, 
a lot of churches over there are. You know, they, and, and in the United States, <laughs> and, yes, and Episcopalian speaking to you on that point. You know, there's an ingrained corruption that goes on. Um, let's hit our next story here, and. As an American, we have kind of a constitutional right to a speedy trial. Okay, if uh, I get brought up on charges, or if I'm indicted, or whatever, I can take the fast route, or I can lawyer up and take the slow route. And the fast route means, you know, that I'll be through the system maybe in a month if I if I take the speedy trial route, and I get booked for speeding or drunk driving or you know whatever. There's a speedy trial route. If you get into the muck of um, being accused within the church, any church, uh, the church polity, like the Church of England, uh, there's almost never a resolution to your accusation, um, to you being accused, and there's never an end to a trial that sometimes never starts. Now we're starting to see the fruits of that. You get accused within the Church of England, but you never have a trial you never get to clear yourself you never get to answer your accuser and so we have an evidence here of a priest who committed suicide george and uh, two two similar stories uh out of the church of england uh that are just dreadful um kevin you're absolutely right for the last 15 20 years as the church of england has gone through scandal after scandal of basically management mistakes uh, idiocy, stupidity. The, con the, the at the end of the investigation, well, lessons will be learned, and that's the you know they tell us that we will learn our lesson from this mishap and not do it again. I'm afraid, Kevin, that's just no damn good anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just been said so often. We've got well, here's the story. One of the London dioceses. There was a retired priest in his seventies. Uh, who was a single gay man, he's retired. The, uh, one of the diocesan officials, I think an archdeacon retired and a new guy was coming into office or a woman and he was debriefed about his work and he was asked, well, is there anybody I should keep my eye on anything? And essentially he said, well, father so-and-so is a bit touchy feely uh, and he's gay. So, you know, keep an eye on out on, out on him. That alone was enough to start a safeguarding investigation that where this guy essentially was proved to us that you're not a pedophile. Uh, now, this basically process was never ending, it was never resolved. He even left the Church of England and became a Roman Catholic. Doesn't matter, it's grinding on. And, it, and, and, and he finally reached the point where this former priest commits suicide. Now, up to this point, this is all opinion as to why he committed suicide. But the coroner issued a report essentially stating the stupidity, callousness, and incompetence of the Church of England's bureaucratic processes drove this man to suicide. That, from the coroner, is a telling uh, indictment. And, of course, the Church of England said, well, lessons will be learned. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the Church of England is happy to apologize for having assisted, uh, I think it was Henry II, I don't remember which king uh, kicked the Jews out 800 yeah. years ago. Um, they'll apologize for that. They'll be deeply, truly, humbly sorry. And they'll apologize for uh, racism against immigrants from Jamaica, against... Uh, the death of Sikhs at Amritsar a hundred years ago by the British Army, by actually the Nepalese soldiers serving under the in the British Army. But can they get their act together and take care of their own people and cheat them with justice and integrity? I think they're incapable of. Yeah. In fact, um, in five hundred just... years, in five hundred years, we shall see. I don't think the church is going to be around in 500 years. Certainly not the Church of England. If the Church of England were around in 500 years, the Archbishop then would certainly issue an apology for the unfortunate suicide of a priest who uh, just got bogged down in the system. You know, the system is pure. Lessons just, will be learned, got, Kevin. Yeah. Lessons will be learned. Uh, and this is in in my book, and everybody knows. You know, I hate hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy. 
you know you, there's no speedy trial there's no way for this man to prove his innocence you just he the, the accusation is out there and then we're going to put you in the mire you know it's almost not it's not a it really there was no complainant it was just sort of the opinion of a retiring priest to keep an eye on so and so because it's a little fruity and touchy feely um now i don't have full facts there may have been more that they're not sharing in personnel files but the coroner's report is damning on mm -hmm. the church of england's callousness and brutality and bureaucratic incompetence and that's where i'm coming from from what the coroner is saying uh next story is from lincoln cathedral yes same sort of incompetence at the church of england on a massive level we reported about the canon chancellor of lincoln cathedral was suspended and on for allegedly touching a girl at a college party uh 20 odd years ago in wales when he was a chaplain at the university one of the universities there well he went through a criminal trial was found not guilty went through a church trial uh and after two and a half three years he was finally exonerated but the process had been so awful, so unchristian that he and his wife had to be treated for suicidal ideation. You know, their lives were destroyed. Well, the Church of England this week said, oops, we made a mistake. Because this happened in Wales, we had no jurisdiction over this. We should have had the Church of Wales do the trial and investigation. Sorry, it didn't count. Now. I don't know if the Church of Wales is going to bother because the guy's been found not guilty twice, but it, how can you? You know, you've got sophisticated lawyers, you've got all these people who have nothing else to do but shuffle the papers into the right boxes, not know something as seer as as jurisdiction. My goodness, uh, Kevin, if you get a speeding ticket when you leave Pennsylvania, do you think the Ohio police are going to prosecute you for it? What are you saying, George? Yeah, is there a way out now? Okay, it, to be honest, I've never had a ticket and I never had an accident, which is why I paid almost nothing for insurance. But there's a way out of the uh, ticket, you're saying? Hmm. Well, yeah, you have to go to the school and pay yeah, a right. lawyer to get it written, you know. No, but... But my, my, I, I was being silly there, sure. but you know, jurisdiction is one of the, the first things you're learning in these proceedings mm -hmm. as a law student, yeah. and they forgot. Yeah. I mean, we just, when there's a Church of England story, it's about somebody's ruined life, and that's got to stop. You, you need to learn your lesson now, Church of England, and just not end up on Anglican.inc as you know, bad news stories. Hey, why don't we try really hard to get a good Church of England news story next week? Yeah, we're trying for Mon for Tuesday. So that's it, not hard if you're talking about people. That's, that's not, not hard true. if you're that's talking true. about people because yeah. you can find men and women across England doing the service and work of God every single day, and good things are happening. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me to try to find a good thing about the institution and the hierarchy of the Church of England, at well, you know, stop clock is right twice a day, so maybe next week will be the right day but the right the right time but it's hard assignment to the audience send us a nice good hearted story from the church of england or about the church of england or within the church of england so we can uh, run with it next week next story story six or five for you guys um i never thought i'd have on my uh storyboard here traditional latin mass and grinder in the same sentence yes we're going to talk about some roman catholic stories uh the world the roman catholic world is turned upside down when uh, pope francis decided that uh traditional latin mass would be uh no longer cop blanche carte blanche everybody can do it it's up to your bishop whether or not your church can conduct the traditional latin mass traditional latin mass is conducted in latin it's traditional and it's been done for a long time it's really a, a strong tradition the church in my town back in verona wisconsin in the mid 80s had the traditional latin mass it's it's old and so this is turned an uproar because a lot of people are just that's their mass george 
and their bishop doesn't want to have that mass in his diocese. And if you look at the, uh, I, I want to use a different word. If you look at the social media uh, Roman Catholic world, they're on fire. This is wrong. This pope is illegitimate. We want Benedict back. Bring back Benedict. Bring back Benedict. Well, I am I am proud to say that this is a good news story for Anglicanism because Pope Francis has <laughs> taken the Anglican approach. He is. Un, under uh, Pope uh, Benedict, uh, the Latin traditional Latin Mass uh, was permitted to be celebrated by the clergy at their sort of at, essentially at their discretion. Right. It was the uh, liturgical uh, authority was up at the highest level. The Pope said, "You could do it. You could do it." And this has been popular in some quarters for many years. Not not all bishops like the Latin Mass. Some see this as a way of dividing the, their diocese uh, between traditionalists and uh, liberals, for want of a better word. I don't think that's a fair word, but no, there you I, are. Uh, upcoming evangelicals. And, and yeah. so there, especially in the United States, there are a number of bishops who are dead set against the Latin Mass. Mm -hmm. Well, now Pope Francis has basically pushed liturgical authority down to the bishops on this level. He's given them a local option, a wonderful Anglican phrase, so that your bishop, if you've been celebrating a Latin Mass in Verona, Wisconsin, if your bishop thinks that's fine, you can go ahead. Can continue. If he doesn't like it, and if you get a new bishop who doesn't like it, tough to you, you've got to celebrate uh, the regular English, the local vernacular Mass. So this is uh, causing a great deal of heat uh, among traditionalists. If you look at Twitter and uh, the various well, blogs, mean, if you look at ch you know some European churches have been celebrating this nonstop for eight hundred years. You know now it's full stop. And you know I, I would you know because their bishop doesn't want it and says forget it we're going back to uh, something else in the missile and. Uh, you know, I could I could see the constraints, the angst. Well, I can actually understand the bishop's position, mm -hmm. um, because if you don't have authority as a bishop, you really are essentially a, a bureaucrat. Now, the argument is, well, of course, Catholic bishops are bureaucrats; they're not decision makers. But in the Anglican world, a, a bishop is the decision maker. Now, a good bishop is somebody who knows how to be flexible and meet people where they are. So a good bishop, even if he can't stand the Latin Mass, would look at the situations of a parish and say, yeah, it's right for them. But if he's got some new guy fresh out of seminary and they don't use the Latin Mass and they can't understand it and they're really upset, he's probably right to say to the new priest, no, don't do it, do the English. And if you want to do a Latin Mass, do an extra one, but don't switch over completely. In other words, we expect our bishops to be intelligent. Now, that's not often the case, but... Sometimes you get lucky, you know. But I, I can't fault Francis because essentially I would I would follow the same local option, but it's predicated on intelligent and pastoral bishops. It is, which is something but, that you can't guarantee. You know, one uh, pope ago, it was okay. You know, so that's yeah, you know, that's the only talking point I want to bring up. Um, I mentioned another word in this story: grinder. What does TLM, traditional Latin Mass, have to do with Grinder? Nothing. They're just two Catholic stories. Okay, don't, don't we're not we're not combining these at all. But I, um, a very prominent Roman Catholic uh, clergy person, who was in charge of investigating um, sex within his Roman Catholic architecture, actually was a prolific member of Grinder bathhouses and other places of ill repute and it made the news it made the social news and now there's two sides there's the liberal side how awful is it that we have to investigate our priest and and follow him on social media that's awful and others like what was he doing in charge of this what's the story george well jeffrey burrell barrel burrell uh, B-U-R-R-I-L-L, was the secretary of the U U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, this is a real high-flying job. 
He and part of and he's been that for about last six years, and before that was the assistant secretary. He uh, is a senior figure in the Catholic hierarchy in the United States, and it's essentially has more authority than most bishops do. And he would have had to go through a background check to get this job. Oh yeah, he would have been thoroughly vetted so that he doesn't do anything embarrassing. He's uh, he's not been sent to Okeechobee, Florida, instead to uh, uh, end his years. Well, the Pillar, which is an online Catholic independent publication, purchased data that is sold by the app Grinder, location services. And okay, it, hold on. We gotta stop here. And I'm glad you don't know this. For my audience who does not know what Grinder is, it's an app that allows people with same sex attraction to have hookups when they travel or they're in the same town it's a little app that you go through and you find people that you're attracted to and you somehow press the buttons and you get to meet that person and have a a hookup so that's what the grinder app is we need i'm glad you don't know that hear me so and and if you want to look into it further grinder is spelled without an e g-r-i-n-d-r um I can't. Uh, I had to look that up because <laughs> uh, it's well, not on my phone. Sorry. So. Evidently, Pillar was able to purchase data from the Grinder app, and was able past data and ongoing data, and was able to monitor Burrell's travel, so that when he went to a town to organize a meeting, they could see that he's spending his evenings in a gay bar and a bathhouse, or he's like beeping, uh, "Come meet me in this hotel room." Uh, for an assignation and they gathered all this data and proved and part of Burrell's job was to oversee the Catholic Church's response to the homosexual crisis and the abuse crisis now before Burrell was brought into this position he had been director of priestly formation at the North American College in Rome one of the high-flying seminaries of the Roman Catholic Church and when the pillar uh, contacted the Burrell for you know comment, why were you in gay bathhouse? And it's not that it, it, this was repeated, extensive, multi multi year. This is just the guy's lifestyle. Wherever he's going, wherever he is, he's having gay hookups again and again and again. When he was contacted, Burrell immediately resigned. Now, the Catholic response has come in two forms. The traditionalist is saying, my God, this is the guy in char was in charge of priestly formation. No wonder we have a homosexuality problem in the clergy. And two, this is the guy who's supposed to be policing this stuff. No wonder the church is hopelessly corrupt. And uh, that's the traditionalist point of view. The liberal point of view is, my God, this guy is being followed online by this... Uh, internet publication there's no privacy anymore how dare we be morality police and i could sort of see a bit of both but i think burrell knew that he had to leave the job because uh, he had committed major sins against his ordination vows that couldn't just be excused um but well, at the same I mean, this, time i don't like the idea of spying on people no i i mean that's the thing is you know uh, somebody somewhere had to say something to this magazine i think you may want to investigate this guy and they went about and did an investigation in the very secular way you purchase the data you follow him uh and you see what he's doing um i'm not really up with that type well, of investigation in the christian realm and we we i think we did go because when you sign up for your Grinder app, uh, I'm, so I'm told, that you uh, basically allow Grinder to sell your data. Yeah, that's that's very common. Facebook. So this know, so. this is not uh, this is not an illegal action. No, I'm not now, saying it's Kevin illegal. I, I'm just saying that I'm uncomfortable with you know a Christian investigation taking this route. Yeah, you know. like Kevin and I had a story about a Church of England bishop where we were sent a. Uh, uh, what's the word? Salacious photo right. of him. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, we basically, uh, Gavin was with us at the time, mm-hmm. and we basically discussed amongst ourselves, well, what do we do with this? We don't publish it. No, it's... Has, you know. has this guy said or done anything? Mm-hmm. In other words, essentially where we left it was, we're keeping a sharp eye on this guy, and if he gets... You know, we reported, for instance, that the former uh, Archbishop of Jerusalem uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, excuse me, when George Curry was Archbishop, was arrested at a men's room for in London for solicitation. We reported that because that was a police story. Mm-hmm. It was on the BBC. I mean, so I have no problems with that. I have a problem of following the Archbishop into the bathroom to see if he does something wrong. Right. Because uh, I'm not looking... Well, how should I put it? Well, I don't want to follow men into public bathrooms <laughs> anyway well, very good george good answer <laughs> i mean but that's but, it i mean how far do we conduct our investigations um you know as journalists we saw that photo and we all knew it's never going to make the press we're not going to publish it but it, it puts this person on a radar just you know this person is on a radar so and, and also basically says like let's say the english bishop who we have the photo of hmm. um if he comes out with a major statement on the housing crisis, I'm happy to report that mm-hmm. and play it up and discuss it. If he's coming out with a major statement on homosexuality and this and that, I'm not really going to give that a great big push because I know the guy's a hypocrite. Yeah, And it's my editorial decision not to make this guy a voice of one side or the other. Oh, actually, the conservative side, when he's leading a life that is in oppo- opposition to his... Uh, uh, profess statements. So, I mean, in other words, I know how to respond appropriately, but it's not by destroying the guy's life. Because yeah. he's doing a good he's doing a good enough job anyway. And at the end of the day, your sins will find you out. And you may have to resign. And maybe uninstall Grinder from your phone, Mister. All right, I'm announced to you. There's a thunderstorm going on right above George's church. We're going to cut the show here. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 675 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>